I've got a, so this is a tweet from Richard E. Bright, who uh, was one of the um, virologists who was kind of, I mean, one of the earliest people I remember raising this possibility of it being a lab leak. Um, and he calls this this invoice for this particular enzyme that Alex mentions in his study. This is an order form uh, for it, and he calls it the equivalent of a smoking gun. On the other hand, uh, Alina Chan, who is another uh, someone who's been very uh, uh, um, sort of putting out the idea of that this could have been a lab leak for a long time. We've had her on the show before. She co-authored a whole book uh, about the origins of COVID with Matt Ridley called Viral. Um, and she's not convinced yet. She says there isn't enough yet to say a lab accident happened beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, mostly because the emails and documents we're talking about are from early 2018. So therefore, it's unsurprising there's not any direct evidence of, you know, a line from this this order to the creation of SARS-CoV-2. You know, I guess an, an open question that I have for both of you is, how should we evaluate evidence and like when when is the appropriate time to say you know case closed this is you know this is the smoking gun we can pretty much say at this point we're never going to get 100 percent certainty but beyond a reasonable doubt looks like something something happened here something was constructed i'm happy to jump in here i think you know what i was doing before covid was specifically forecasting which species are quasi species that are jump capable? What's the likelihood of that emerging? Where is it likely to emerge? Um, and what does that look like? And we all have actually seen a recent example of a natural spillover with the avian influenza outbreaks that happened last year. Many people got infected and you see these stuttering chains of transmission because exactly as Emily said, the virus was not very transmissible when it first jumped into the human population. And so for me, what jumped out is like, you know, we'll put the line way over here for case closed. And then there's a line way over here for open the books. <laughs> and I think mm-hmm. we crossed the open the books line immediately. When SARS-CoV-2 emerged, it had a receptor binding domain that was better at binding humans than bats. That's a really unusual feature for a bat coronavirus. Viruses specialize on their hosts. They get these very specific moldings of their spike genes, the receptors of their hosts, The receptors of bats are different from humans, so this should be molded to a bat, but instead it looked more molded to a human than a bat. So that was immediately a a very strange occurrence that it didn't have this multiple spillover events across a wide geographic range consistent with the animal trade outbreak of SARS-1. There were not infections concentrated in animal handlers like we saw in civet handlers in SARS-1 or in poultry farmers for avian influenza. Instead, it was this singular outbreak that just exploded immediately out of Wuhan with a SARS coronavirus whose receptor binding domain was better fit for humans than bats that had a furin cleavage site that as someone, again, in this wildlife virology community, I knew that many virologists were fixated on furin cleavage sites. This was something that virologists thought a lot about. But when you look at the data in nature, nature did not stumble upon it that often. Instead, when it happened, we looked, made a big deal out of it, wrote big papers about it, and everyone was aware of it, but nature was not. And so for me, it was, we crossed the line to open the books almost immediately at the start of the pandemic. But there's never been, that. that's never seemed to have been the attitude. Um, you know, uh, it, uh, opening the books, uh, requ- it, it would what would follow from that is, you know, op- open scientific, this is a, this is an empirical question. It's so that, that requires open scientific inquiry, but I, you know, I think to kind of capture the tone of that, we can just look at these tweets from uh, Christian Anderson, who was uh, one of the authors on the famous proximal origins paper that uh, proposed that this jump from pangolins to humans, uh, that pangolins were the intermediate host. And then um, it was revealed through documents that he had these kind of this back channel with Anthony Fauci, who was sort of guiding that project the entire time. But his reaction to your uh, preprint, Alex, was that uh, it is so deeply flawed that it wouldn't pass kindergarten molecular biology. It's more of the same poppycock dressed up as science with a heavy dose of technobabble on the side. 
And, you know, you don't have to reply to that kind of name calling, though you can if you want. What I'd like to know is um, what are the challenges for <laughs> dissenting scientists at this point in examining the, this question? Obviously, there's been challenges along the way, but like, at this point, do you feel that your paper could even get a fair peer review or, or is the process itself kind of compromised? Well, a couple of points here. One, yeah, the feedback from Christian Anderson was not the most constructive feedback we received. <laughs> um, another little aside, my mom was a molecular biologist. So in kindergarten, I was doing some, you know, listening about DNA at the table, but not that much, admittedly. Um, and then finally, you know, a lab origin involves a lab and the lab involves researchers and researchers are in this network of colleagues and funders. And so when we pass this open the books phase very early on in the pandemic, we would have liked to hear about, for example, the diffuse proposal. But did we hear about the diffuse proposal? No, we didn't. Um, did we hear that NIAID had actually funded the unique collaboration of the diffuse PIs in 2019? No, we didn't. Instead, Anthony Fauci helped prompt that proximal origin paper Peter Daszak, the PI of Diffuse, wrote a paper to The Lancet calling lab origin theories conspiracy theories without acknowledging the conflict of interest that he was working with the lab in question, that he wrote the Diffuse proposal containing a highly specific proposal to make something not found in nature, something so unnatural that you could have patented it in 2018, and SARS-CoV-2 would be an infringement of their patent. That's a very important conflict of interest he should have disclosed when we were at the open the books phase in January of 2020. And he didn't. Just to follow up on a, a couple of the things that um, Alex was mentioning, I think in yeah. addition to the scientific evidence that we dug up and that he dug up, I think it's also important to look at the behavioral clues here and the odd um, actions of people sort of central to the coronavirus research going on in Wuhan after SARS-CoV-2 emerged from that city, um, including the fact that Varick was working on this model that was meant to predict whether a coronavirus could cause disease in humanized mice using, um, you know, the receptor binding domain's ability to bind to humanase 2 and fear and cleavage sites. And then when SARS-CoV-2 with this un these unique features showed up, did not raise his hand to say, I actually have a model. You know, I've been studying this yeah. for years. Um, you know, it's an here's odd my silence for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And, um, and why did Dazic continue to insist for years that this work would go on at the University of North Carolina under a BSL-3 when clearly he knew, you know, he wrote this comment saying that in fact, this work would be outsourced to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and would be conducted under BSL-2. Yeah, so, let me pull that up. Uh, this is from those those documents. So uh, yeah, you you got the the annotated comments on um, their proposal. And so here you've got uh, um, Peter Dazak saying that, you know, if we win the contract, I am not proposing that all the work will necessarily be conducted by Ralph Barrick in North Carolina, but he wants to stress the U.S. side of the proposal to DARPA so that they're comfortable. In, in other words, he wants to play down the fact that, as he says, a lot of these this work can be done in Wuhan. Um, and then further down, you've got Ralph Barrick uh, talking about their proposal to, in China, do this in a biosecurity level two rather than the higher biosecurity level three that would be expected the U.S. And he says that, you know, um, the, if they're they're growing those in under BSL two in China, U.S. researchers will likely freak out, and so yeah, there, there's really that it's very revealing of the 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 mindset and and the culture of like, I mean, the, these are people who have a a really serious responsibility of handling a virus that can kill lots of people and just just wreak societal destruction, and they're kind of like what can we slip past DARPA? And and again, luckily DARPA did not approve this particular grant, but it does say a lot about kind of the atmosphere. Uh, what what was the, the cavalier attitude of the scientists that are, are working with these, these really deadly, uh, da dangerous viruses? 
Uh, but uh, Emily, uh, continue with your your explanation of the the psychology, and then if you could also talk a little bit about the media coverage of uh, the lab leak at present. Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're spot on there. I mean, Barrick said that U.S. researchers would freak out about this work being outsourced to BSL two in China before uh, uh, you know virus um, started circulating the globe um, out of. Wuhan. So, um, of course, he knew people would freak out about this. Um, and instead of doing what I think would be the moral patriotic thing and being transparent um, and coming forward, uh, they attempted to save their own reputations. And clearly, Dazic made a bet that these documents would never come out. And so he kept lying to his sources and um, and media and lying to other scientists that this work was to be done in um more rigorous biosafety standards of the U.S. And he knew that to be a lie. Um, he also said that they didn't sample in Laos, and that was also a lie. You know, some of SARS-CoV-2's closest relatives circulate in Southeast China, so that's highly relevant information to the origins of COVID. Um, and people looked in GenBank and said, it says that this this was sampled in Laos. Uh, what's going on? Um, and our documents also confirmed their intention to sample there. So, um, so the behavior is very strange. The Lancet letter organizing that and telling Ralph Barrick to leave his name off. Um, it's, you know, I think that speaks volumes as well. And then also I did want to answer your original question about what is, what would constitute kind of final firm evidence. I yeah. think the, um, the research described in the documents that we and Drastic obtained um, probably describe how SARS-CoV-2 became SARS-CoV-2, but we don't know what viruses they were starting with. We don't know at the time they were exchanging these notes and having these conversations if they had sampled SARS-CoV-2-like viruses at that point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we know they uh, have identified RITG-13, one of SARS-CoV-2's closest relatives, um, but... I think we need to know more information about that. But if we were to confirm that they were doing, using some of the techniques described in these documents with SARS-CoV-2 like viruses, I think that would be, I mean, as close to like a final smoking gun as you could get. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our new show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. New episodes drop every week, so subscribe to Reason TV's YouTube channel to get notified when that happens, or to the Just Asking Questions podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcatcher. See you next week.